all, first of all, thank you for joining and welcome to today's webinar, What if Commercial Vehicles Were Shaping a New Sustainable Future? I am Virginie Toussaint and I will act as the moderator for today's session. In today's webinar, our expert panel of leaders from the commercial vehicle industry, together with Capgemini specialists, will share their insights on the impact of different technology innovations on sustainable transport solutions, the driving factors, and how major macro factors influence the tracks market. Our speakers today are Edouard Rochard, Director Electric Vehicles Product Line, European Medium Duty Trucks from Volvo Group, Klaus Feldman, CTO for Automotive Sustainability and E-Mobility at Capgemini Engineering, and Jeroen van der Werf, Lead Center of Expertise Sustainable Mobility at Capgemini Engineering. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few important points. If you have any questions during the session, you can send it in the Q&A console and submit them for our speakers. The webinar recording and presentation will be, of course, available afterwards on our website. With that, I invite Klaus Feldman from Capgemini Engineering to start the session. Thanks, Virginie, and a very warm welcome from my side to the audience. I would like to give you a forward from our CEO, Eamon Essert. We firmly believe that a sustainable future is achievable only with deep industry-wide collaboration with our clients, suppliers, and other stakeholders. The Green Deal. Delivering the European Green Deal. All 27 EU member states committed to turning the EU into the first climate neutral continent by 2050. There are targets from reducing the CO2 emissions set for new cars and vans. 55% reduction of emissions from cars by 2030 compared to 1990. 50% reduction of emissions from vans by 2030 compared to 1990, but zero emissions from new cars by 2035. Reduction of CO2 emissions from heavy duty vehicles are also mentioned in the Green Deal. Target is from 2025, manufacturers will have to meet the targets set for the fleet wide average CO2 emissions of their new lorries registered in a given calendar year. The targets are 15% reduction of emission from heavy duty vehicles by 2025 by using already available technologies. 30% reduction of emissions from heavy duty vehicles by 2030, and this will be assessed in 2022, so means this year. But it creates a benefit. Reduce fuel consumption costs for transport operators, mostly small and medium enterprises and consumers. Help maintain the technological leadership of the EU manufacturers and suppliers. Technology. Different technologies for sustainable drive lines. We don't would like to focus today on the uh, excavators and diggers. We only would like to focus on the real commercial vehicles. Which technologies are a sustainable drive line? Local emission free are battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Emission reduced or partly emission free are the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, but also emission reduced are the hydrogen ICE vehicles, the LNG, the liquid natural gas, and the e-fuels. But three of them have the possibility to be emission free because they are propelled by an electric drivetrain and have a battery on board. Different technologies for sustainable drive lines. Which drivetrain technology will be the right one for the sustainability? Principally said all, oh, because it will depend on your ecosystem, your infrastructure availability, your business. Explanation. All solutions have a different impact on the CO2 emission overall, the well-to-wheel, depending on your ecosystem. 
the right solution will be influenced by the available infrastructure, because if you want to be, for example, electrified, there is a need for the right charging infrastructure. The total cost of ownership, because you have to make your choices related to your cost over use time. The business, what you know as best to operate as efficient as possible. But overall, we will only win the race if we are the earliest as possible emission free. The well to wheel explanation. It explains where you can get the energy out of the earth with all the things what you must do with, including the transport to the fuel or refilling station that is well to tank. And from this to the wheel, so to drive a vehicle that is tanked to wheel, and overall, it's the well to wheel. The well to wheel emission comparison is shown here um, a slide for, of course, passenger cars, but the technology and targets are more or less the same. So, with the right choice of technology, which is an ICE with renewable fuels, a battery electric vehicle with the expected uh, power mix in Europe by 2030, the battery electric green electricity and fuel cell vehicles, these are the technologies where you can achieve the goals. But also it's very important to understand the well to tank efficiency comparison versus the electricity. So for example, if you have one kilowatt hour primary energy produced by a wind turbine and would like to use this energy to produce hydrogen in a gas format, you only get 60%, 61% efficiency. In the future, you have a potential and we are looking for 70%, but only the well to tank efficiency. And the other ones you see also in the slide. But come to a little bit more deeper inside. If we look to the well to wheel, the overall efficiency of a hybrid fuel cell vehicle and a battery electric vehicle, we start with both with 100% renewable energy with a wind turbine. It's shown on the left slide, on the left side. If you go for an electric vehicle, you have losses in the transport and storage somewhere, somehow. It's around 20% overall. But then from tank to wheel, it's an additional 4%. But really be clear on it. We have an overall efficiency rate of around 76% if we use electric energy and have a pure battery electric vehicle. You can make the choice for hydrogen technology. If you do the same, you have 100% renewable energy in the beginning, but you must electrolyze, you must compress, you must transport, you must fill and use it in a fuel cell and then also in a smaller battery, but to the electric engine. And you have only 30% overall efficiency rate. What it means roughly, if you go for hydrogen, you need two and a half times more primary energy. This means instead of this, you must build up this in the environment. Infrastructure. Infrastructure checked by technology. You see on the left, all the technology, what I mentioned before. The energy source, what you need to drive this kind of uh, technology, it's electrical power, hydrogen, electrical power, fuel, liquid, natural gas, and all the things. But the primary energy source is mostly everywhere electrical power, plus fossil oil or natural gas. Let's check the infrastructure and technology. For battery electric vehicles, we have both. We have the infrastructure and the technology is available. For hydrogen, I made a red cross because I said the infrastructure is not there. And also we made comments on the other technologies. With the orange one said, yes, infrastructure is there, but it must be changed a little bit compared to the fossil fuel infrastructure. Let's make a availability check in detail. This is a card of Europe. You see a lot of blue, blue spots. 
These are the public charging points versus the hydrogen refilling public points versus the public natural gas refilling stations. Let's look a little bit more in detail to see really what it means in detail. You see a lot of blue spots there in the left side. These are the charging points. If you look to the hydrogen refilling station, there are only a few. And if you look to LNG, the most are in the Netherlands and Belgium and somewhere a little bit in Italy and one or others around in Europe. So today we have around 360,000 public charging points. These are divided by different power levels. To use it, to make it usable for heavy duty vehicles and commercial vehicles, and I think it's reasonable to look for a power rate more than 150 kilowatt. But they have huge targets, the EU. 1 million public charging stations by 2025 and 3 million by 2030. So means in around two and a half years from now, we should triple the public charging points. But also, if you would like to work with battery electric vehicle, there is a need for an end-to-end -end charge power smart grid because the renewable energies can be stored in an energy storage, which can be second life batteries, which can be also a hydrogen storage. But then the commercial vehicles are coming to charge points and connect it. They need electrical power. So you create an electric load on the grid, but we would like to have it most efficient and green. So means the <clears throat> renewable energies must be provided as much as possible to the grid. If we don't have enough power available, we can use also the additional power from the energy storages. But also it could be that we need polluting energy, but we should minimize it or better, we should eliminate it. For this, we need a lot of data. The data, what we need, are data between the vehicles and the charge infrastructure. The vehicles must feed the data pool with information. The charge infrastructure must feed the data pool with information. Also, the energy storages, the renewable energy producers, because we would like to have all green energy which is available and eliminate the polluting energy. The goal is charge all vehicles to needed SOC in time with max green power and intelligence to be able to work with the existing infrastructure. And now I will hand over to my colleague Jeroen van der Werf. Thanks. Well, thank you, Klaus. Um, I will uh, guide uh, the audience through the uh, next part of the presentation for the logistics optimization we've checked the data from the german government and we see that uh, 3200 million tons of goods are transported over the german roads um, this amount of uh, goods is transported in 258 million trips um, and uh, next to that also transport vehicles were driving 153 million trips without any cargo those empty trips uh, took almost 6.6 .6 billion kilometers um, where uh, the vehicles were driving over the German roads without transporting any goods. That's 28.7% um, of the kilometers driven uh, with empty vehicles. We've checked uh, whether this um, percentage is, is uh, for Germany is representative for other countries throughout Europe. And in uh, the right side of this uh, slide, you see that um, the exact percentages differ from country to country, uh, but it's all in the same uh, range. Um, we also see that for national transportation, uh, the percentages of empty uh, kilometers driven is slightly higher than for international. If you look at uh, this amount of um, kilometers driven with empty vehicles, uh, we've calculated that it will take 1.3 billion liters of diesel um, to have those vehicles powered. 
uh, 1.3 billion liters of diesel will cause uh, 3.5 billion tons of CO2 emission. And uh, for the transport organizations, uh, procuring 1.3 billion liters of diesel will cost them 2.5 billion euros. Or if this happen to be electric vehicles, 6.6 .6 billion kilometers will take uh, 7.9 billion kilowatt hours. Um, for that, um, it's important to reduce the amount of uh, empty uh, uh, trips of vehicles. We see that um, in a research conducted by the Automotive Center of Expertise in the Netherlands, um, one of the solutions could be uh, to the introduction of autonomous and connected trucks. Um, uh, Automotive Center of Expertise has calculated that uh, connected autonomous trucks could save 66 billion euros in net present value over the next 25 years for the Netherlands, but it's also saving uh, 0.7 billion kilograms of CO2 uh, every year only for the Netherlands and 26 million kilograms of NOx, again only for the Netherlands. This um, reduction of emission is uh, mainly caused by more efficient uh, use of the vehicles and a more optimized uh, driving efficiency of that vehicles. If we uh, look for other logistic op optimizations, um, we uh, suggest that also um, we should rethink our current offering. From globalization with the uh, ever-growing uh, logistic uh, uh, chain, where uh, the supply chains were over spread out over longer distances. Um, if we go back to localization, we could reduce the amount of transport needed. Um, if we also promote the integration of uh, transport capacity over different uh, logistic service providers, uh, we see an optimization possible in um, making best use of the available capacity and therefore further reduce the amount of uh, empty trips over the, uh, over the European and worldwide road. Um, it's also important to invest in digital. By investing uh, in a digital infrastructure, uh, the logistic service providers uh, can uh, optimize uh, their uh, execution by the use of automation and artificial intelligence. If we um, look at that um, digital optimization, we see a digital transformation in uh, several uh, directions. For a sustainable uh, transportation, we see an uh, investment uh, in artificial intelligence for route optimization and therefore uh, enable the fleet uh, managers to reduce fuel um, by choosing uh, the, the most fuel efficient uh, route from origin to destination. Um, to enable um, capacity load sharing over the different service providers, um, it's important to uh, have an ability to share the data without giving away their sensitive information. And blockchain technology could uh, be a very good uh, answer to that, um, that need. Um, further, um, we also see a very important role for predictive maintenance where artificial intelligence can predict uh, the best maintenance moment for a vehicle to reduce stoppages and minimize producer, uh, production losses. Um, by improving the operational effectiveness um, uh, with artificial intelligence, it's, um, uh, we can optimize the effectiveness of the, of the vehicles uh, used by transport organizations. And last but not least, as uh, Klaus already mentioned, um, we should make best use of the renewable energy at the moment that it's available. And artificial intelligence can help to, uh, to improve the use of renewable energy. Then I would like to have a look at the total cost of ownership, um, because total cost of ownership is one of the most important decision making tools for uh, organizations uh, for their uh, investment and uh, their um, way of operation. And if we look at uh, a report of the Elsevier, we see that the um, light and the medium duty segment the vehicles are already uh, very competitive in the low carbon uh, uh, vehicle types. But for low carbon vehicles in the heavy duty segment, it's really depending on the local regulation. 
Um, and there, there are three main uh, uh, DCO parameters that drive their competitiveness. First of all, the toll that needs to be paid in that specific country, also the fuel costs, and last but not least, the subsidies for the ownership of a vehicle. Um, so we see that the policy uh, uh, support is crucial in the increase of adoption, specifically in the heavy duty segment. Now, what's um, uh, the report uh, based on? Uh, you see at the left side, you see the calculation method for the total cost of ownership. And in the right side, you see the different um, countries with their different total cost of ownership per engine type of the vehicle. If we then zoom in on three countries, France, Germany, and Switzerland, we see that for all those countries, the battery electric vehicle, the BET, battery electric truck, are, is competitive in the total cost of ownership to all other, and specifically also to the diesel engine. If you look at um, the heavy duty truck, we see that for Switzerland, uh, the battery electric truck is competitive, but for France and Germany, it's just not uh, winning from the diesel engine. The reason for that is that in Switzerland, the battery electric vehicle has a toll uh, discount and therefore the total cost of ownership is reduced. Well, with that part, I would like to give the word back to Klaus. Thank you, Jeroen. I would like to talk about the sustainable and social culture dimensions. Sustainability generally refers to the ability of the biosphere and human civilization to coexist. In a generic and sociological way, sustainability can be defined as a capacity to bring the future in the present time management in order to act and behave in symbiosis with the world around us. How to integrate the social culture values. The dynamic of sustainability in our societies has its foundation in the following social culture values. The values provide us with mean following hints for solution development. Intuitive technology to make life simpler, more magical. Disbelief, be surprised, the wow effect. Emotions as a carrier of meaning and as a fuel for life. Sharing, support, intimacy. Desire to take concrete actions to change society and response to social and environmental challenges, the social utilization. Reassurance and protection in an uncertain world. Harmlessness, safety, trust. Need for personal expression and singularity, questioning authority, fighting for one's rights, simplification of life and reliving constraints, practicality, simplicity, easy. Desire for more humanity, sharing solidarity, authenticity, empathy, individual responsibility. A summary. To achieve all this, there is a need for regulations, technology, infrastructure, logistic optimization, the digital transformation, and react on the social culture dimensions. Thanks, and I would like to hand over to Mr. Eduard Ruscha. Thanks. Thank you very much, Klaus. Then I will drive you through trying to give you a, a bit of another perspective, very specific to uh, our view at the Volvo Group uh, and uh, how electrification of trucks is going on right now. So I will start with a bit of a perspective uh, of what is the context here um, that, that we already touched earlier before in this presentation. Then I will drive you through uh, electrification of commercial vehicles. Where are we right now and where are we heading at? And then trying to take a, a concrete example uh, towards urban deliveries, a specific use case. Starting with uh, this, um, we have to, and I mean, it's not an option, we have to limit the warming rates. 
Um, and 1.5 degree by 2040 uh, has been set at the world level as the bare acceptable limits. And it's definitely uh, humanity at stake here and it's future generation at stake by that. So it's, it's really our duty to make sure that uh, we are meeting uh, that and not overlapping that uh, criteria here. So this being said, what does it mean? And what do we have to do in practice? Right, then in front of us, it's a major challenge. And if we look at what happened since the 1900s, um, CO2 emissions have been raising extremely high and peaking to where we are now. And uh, right now, it's really our role uh, to, to change the shape of this and take the steep downhill that you see on the screen so that by 2040, uh, we are at the world level completely um, uh, decarbonating our, our world, basically. And uh, well, it's a challenge for all of us and uh, as a, in our personal life, but it's also a major challenge for the industry and for us as uh, commercial vehicle manufacturers. And this is where we are now, actually. We are really at the very start and it's basically our duty now to make it happen. Then, of course, this is regulated, as you mentioned, class. Uh, this is regulated by EU in order to push uh, the industry and uh, the commercial vehicle industry uh, towards uh, decarbonating. Everything started in 2019 uh, with uh, uh, being a, really the reference year where uh, every uh, manufacturer was uh, referencing his, his level of uh, CO2 emissions. And then there is two steps, 2025, starting with uh, CO2 emission minus 15%, and then 2030, a second step uh, with CO2 emissions minus 30% compared to uh, this reference year. Of course, if we are not meeting this, these are, these are penalties uh, that we are after here. And um, looking at those penalties, I mean, those who are not willing to decarbonate will just no longer be in business because this is, this is just so high that this is not sustainable. So really, uh, it is a journey that is pushed by the regulation so that we decarbonate and that there is no other way forward. Uh, you would look as well at this specific part here where uh, zero emission vehicles are, are also pushed by those regulations, meaning that they are even getting some credits uh, uh, in the scoring assessing the, the, the CO2 reduction. So even EU regulations pushing for zero emission vehicles there. So not only, not only um, European regulation, but also uh, local regulations there are um, setting the frame of what needs to happen in the future. Pollution is you know, happening within uh, the highest rate in the crowded area and inside the city. So hence, uh, on top of those uh, uh, regulation at European level, for sure the cities are pushing very, very hard as well for uh, banning basically um, uh, polluting vehicles. We always see a trend starting from now and, to, and down to 2040 that the cities will more and more ban um, vehicles that are polluting outside of their walls and much quicker than um, what we see from, from the EU regulation. So, so to say that this is also pushing us forward uh, to go for zero emission vehicle. And you see on the map here that already today, uh, it's a number of cities that have already taken a lot of measures to uh, reduce drastically their pollution, pollution emission uh, inside their walls. Then, uh, where are we uh, in our electrification journey for commercial vehicles? Um, this is uh, the roadmap uh, that the Volvo Group has decided uh, going forward to perform this transition to decarbonate the industry. Uh, and we have set a clear path where by 2040, uh, we will have transformed most of our uh, trucks basically to uh, electric vehicles, be it battery electric or uh, fuel cell electric vehicle. Um, so this is really the roadmap that we have set. And this is where we are today. It's only the start. It's only the starting point. Uh, but uh, we are already there. And if you look at um, 
the whole group here, this is the product lineup that, that we have starting from all application in the commercial vehicle, starting from distribution vehicles, small ones, up to the haulers, uh, going through the construction as well applications that uh, already are electrified and that will set the path uh, to the roadmap that I shared just before. Then uh, let's try to look at a specific use case and the use case of urban deliveries. Urban deliveries, uh, it's a number of mega trends um, ongoing. So it's urbanization that is going you know, quicker and quicker, more and more cities, they are getting more and more crowded. Uh, E-commerce as well, we are all asking for you know, more deliveries to our doors coming from the internet. Uh, so this is growing like 20, 30% per year, and this will continue. Uh, these kind of mega trends are really setting a case where the demand for distribution inside cities is growing very much. And what is interesting is to look in the perspective of the transportation costs. Today, uh, from the factory, which could be somewhere in China, to somewhat 10 to 20 kilometers nearby your house, then you would spend 50% of the transportation cost. And so that means one, one half of it. And then the other half is only to run the last 10 to 20 kilometers between, between the warehouse to your door. So just looking at those numbers, th that just gives a clear view that there is optimization somewhere that is really needed uh, because this is just not sustainable. And this is what we are after here. How can we, from the transport industry, how can we optimize this situation here for, let's say, the last mile delivery? So let's look at what is it actually that we should achieve there to drive um, a much better optimized use case and then a much better uh, sustainability. So of course, it all starts with uh, zero emission trucks. So it has to be a zero emission trucks and we have chosen to be a battery electric vehicle. Uh, it has to be a truck, by the way, uh, because the idea is very much to massify the deliveries and to avoid uh, too many vans inside cities, but more to massify inside a bigger truck that is also a driver here. Uh, then these trucks uh, is operating in cities and the cities are, as I said before, more and more crowded. So there are more and more uh, soft uh, means to, to move inside the cities like bikes, li like even pedestrian, everything. So it has to be a truck that is really safe uh, while operating in cities. So the value proposal of the, the, the truck here has to be uh, really uh, safe in the environment of, of the of the city and the truck also has to bring efficiency because this is what we are after here in the delivery mission it has to be it has to drive efficiency in basically the delivery mission and when we look at uh, the driver's mission just to understand a little bit what we are after here it's during a day uh, delivering cargoes uh, to, to customers inside the cities basically would spend somewhat one third of his time driving inside the city, inside the city walls. Uh, and there it has to be safe, as I said. And then he would spend 40% of his time delivering the parcel. So meaning that uh, the, 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 the logistic aspects and the, the, the cargo handling needs also uh, to be uh, optimized in order to drive the efficiency. So this is the parameters that uh, we should play here in order to, to create uh, the, the optimized solution. And this is what we are after. That We as a manufacturer building trucks here want to be part of this journey and the electrification, this is what I will share in that, in that slide here, the electrification is very much an enabler to catch and to bring solutions uh, that will drive this optimization and this sustainability. So we started the journey with first electrifying trucks. And to, to be clear, what we have done while electrifying trucks that we just removed the uh, combustion engine and we try to fit all the power electronics into some kind of uh, an engine shape so that we can put it instead of the combustion engine inside the vehicle. So th this is how trucks are electrified nowadays. Now, what is interesting uh, 
is to say, okay, what if we don't have this combustion engine? So then we do not have that big thing under the cab. So being electrified now, can we think things differently? And can we use that space of uh, the engine where it was to do something else and to bring some features uh, that will drive the values that I shared in the slide before? And there, what we can do here is basically removing that engine, then you can allow yourself to put the cab much lower uh, and a little bit to the front so that you are able to bring the features that are driving efficiency in this um, delivery mission. And by that, I mean, having a low cab, you have much better visibility. So you are much more safe uh, compared to a standard truck operating inside the city. And again, this is a very important value for a truck that is operating inside the urban area. Also, uh, you can allow yourself to have the driver, for example, stepping out from the right, as you see on the picture here, uh, with a much more easy um, ingress and outgress of the, of the truck. And that will really ease the mission and drive efficiency at the end, really make the mission much easier and much more comfortable. So that is one example of, let's say, not having the comb combustion engine and maximizing the potential of, of the cab here that is driving the value that we are looking for. And then let, let, let's think even beyond here. Now, what if uh, we don't have the frame rails anymore? I mean, we don't have the engine, so why not also disrupting the rear of the truck? And in that case, uh, we could think uh, something completely different in terms of um, design of the rear of the truck and, and we design of the chassis, and we can think about something that is also helping very much the cargo delivery with much more optimized um, low, low, uh, low floor uh, vehicle where the cargo is quite easily access accessible and that then you would get a lot of efficiency when the driver will handle this cargo basically while charging or uncharging. So this is all the potential that we can see in a use case, which is the one of the urban distribution. Then what we are used to say here is that together uh, we shape the world that we want to live in. So Virginie, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Mr. Rochard, Feldman and Van de Werf for the insights and for Hi. taking us through this exciting commercial vehicles webinar around sustainability. So I propose now to begin answering the questions uh, submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still send some questions through the Q&A console in your attendee control panel. And of course, we will try to answer as many questions as possible during our Q&A session. So we've got a first question from Mr. Klaus Feldman, Edouard Rochard and Klaus van Velt. Um, so the first question we can see is maybe uh, for you, Mr. Edouard Rochard. Uh, so the first one is how much energy, according to you, is onboarded in the batteries of the truck? It, a good question. Uh, it very much depends on the application of the trucks. So basically, for a truck that will run maybe in urban areas, you might onboard 200 kilowatt hours. Uh, but if you want to go down to the long haulage, uh, what we are after is uh, uh, up to, let's say, 800 kilowatt hours is what we would target to really perform that usage. So it's really wide depending on the application. Thank you very much. I think that we, we've got as well another question related to, to batteries and maybe um, Klaus Feldman, I think it's a question also certainly for you. Uh, which change of battery technology will we see in the future according to you? Um, that's also a very good question. So um, I think battery will be a game changer in the future. So a lot of chemistries are let's say in um at this moment in use but a lot of is stated to solid state batteries so in my point of view solid state will be a game changer because they have much higher energy density um related to what we what we know now but the problem is that we are not able to uh, manufacture them then today as a serious product, 
but also the battery technology, what we have today, like uh, lithium NMC or lithium LMA or lithium titan null oxide, the LTO, they have their place in applications. And of course, they are in a development phase for more than 30 years. So we will see them also in the future. But let's say ending of this decade, we will see definitely a change to a lot of solid state applications, especially in the commercial vehicle area. Thank you very much, Klaus. And maybe I think that uh, related also to, to batteries, it's just uh, another question for you, and, and I think we will have our, an, others to, to answer. Um, according to you, Klaus, uh, how we can use batteries for a second life application? That's also an interesting question that the audience is questioning. I think it's a, a very important question because uh, with, a, with the technology of electrification, we have first time really the possibility to use something what we had in the first life so the battery also for other usages so means that normally after the uh, first life which is defined by normally 80 percent state of health that the battery should not be used um, in the uh, automotive sector but sometimes you can also use it to to 75 percent state of health there is an important need to use this battery in second life applications and not directly recycle them and um, that can be also create a, a really a good business case for the end customer but also for the oems because that is a a, a part of the of the commercial vehicle itself which can be reduced and had definitely um, the availability to create a use case after the first life or after the life of the vehicle itself. So it's a very important topic for the future. Thank you very much, Klaus. That, that's uh, indeed a, an interesting question that uh, certainly uh, would, would be necessary to answer widely in another session. But thank you so much. And um, we've got as well some questions specifically around the cost of the charge infrastructure. Maybe I think that, Jeroen, that could be an interesting question you could answer. How are the costs of the charge infrastructure integrated into the TCO model? Well, it's a, indeed a good question because the, um, the electric vehicle has a a slightly different cost model than the, the fuel, uh, fuel vehicles. For fuel, the sales price of the fuel is uh, integrated in the cost model. But for battery electric trucks, the cost of the charge station at the depot um, is integrated in the, in the model. Uh, it's assumed that um, for the truck, um, the trucks are charged at the depot. And on top of the cost for electricity, also the uh, cost for uh, procurement of the charge station and uh, the installation um, is integrated in the cost model. And it's assumed that the um, charging infrastructure is uh, used for uh, 15 years. Thank you, Jeroen. And based on your experience, uh, your, your expertise, um, there is a question also much more largely about what are the largest costs for fleet operations? That's also a key question the audience have. Well, we see that um, uh, the largest uh, portion of the costs are uh, the cost for the driver. That's about one third of the total cost. Um, also a very large cost component, but slightly smaller are the costs for fuels. That's about 25% uh, uh, of the total uh, exploitation costs. Thank you so much, Jeroen. Um, I think that we have time maybe to, to take three or more questions. Um, that would be also certainly interesting. And, and uh, maybe Mr. Edouard Rochard could be interesting to, to have your point of view. How about fuel cells electric vehicle versus battery electric vehicles? That's also a a key point of view that can be shared. Uh, it's a key question, and it's it's a bit of a one million dollar question uh, that that we don't have the answer yet. But what is for sure is that 
at least I will speak from, from the Volvo Group standpoint, we, we bet also on the fuel cell electric vehicle, um, but we bet on them for um, the long haulage vehicles, for the trucks that, that really need um, to, to perform a lot of miles to, to, during the day. Um, and this is where we think that, that this technology uh, can break through. Uh, however, uh, and this is because of, the, of all the parameters of the TCO, because of the cost, because of, uh, of um, the capability to, uh, to, to perform the mileage without onboarding tons of batteries. Uh, so, so we bet on this. However, uh, who knows how the batteries will, will move forward. Uh, going in the, in the future, you mentioned the solid states. So uh, let's see how, how this can compete to the fuel cell in the future. So, so we really need to assess both technologies going forward and make the right choice there. Um, so that, that's for long haulage. Then when you think about uh, smaller trucks and uh, inner city trucks, for example, or, or you know, those kind of distribution or refuse trucks there, there we are less convinced that, that fuel cell can, can really make the breakthrough. For sure, we follow the technology and things are going quick, so we might change our mind. But here, for now, looking at the potential of battery electric vehicle and how to perform on the TCO uh, for those trucks that are not running so much miles and with the given technology that we have today and the forecast we see for the, the years to come, there we believe that, that uh, BEV uh, still have a way forward uh, for the years to come. Thank you very much, Mr. Rochard. Um, I can see on the console that there is also an additional question on how does the flex fuel seem to turn out in the future? Also considering limited availability of lithium, uh, how will the BEV be, be sustainable? I don't know if uh, one, of, one of you <laughs> wants to answer. So specifically on the flex fuel, uh, considering the limited availability of lithium. So how will the BEV uh, be sustainable? So I, I like to, to mention something to it. Um, so first of all, uh, it, it's really a question, do we have really um, a leak of lithium? Mm. That, is, that is the first question overall in my point yeah. of view. But, exactly. but really flex fuel, what it, what it means really. So flex fuel, um, I think we have only one chance, and that is what I, what I mentioned before, to achieve the goals to be emission-free. We have no other chance to stop with polluting drives. That is a clear statement. From, from a sustainable point of view, there is no plan B. So, and, and it's not a point we have no chance to fail because our planet is really in the situation that we must act and act on the right way. So. Um, depends on the availability of, um, let's say, materials for, for battery electric um, vehicles. The point is we must come really to the point that we are have the possibility to come in a circular economy. So means, yes, of course, first of all, we must have a lot of material to support the battery electric manufacturing process to let run the vehicles uh, uh, drive with this technology. But after the second life where the battery is not usable for any applications anymore, there is a need for the recycling and bring the raw materials really back to the economy. So we can achieve a circular economy and that should be our goal. Otherwise, we don't win our race. It's my thank you so much. Of... Yeah, thank you so much for, for your point of view. That's uh, certainly a very interesting question that uh, we try to answer with the audience. Um, thank you so much, uh, Klaus, for that. Uh, many questions are asked, so we, we have time to take, I think, two last questions. And of course, uh, if we cannot get to your question specifically, uh, due to a lack of time, we will respond to you over an email, of course. But um, I think that there is also a, a two last interesting question. Maybe one, um, when can we start to see urban distribution tracks on the road? Maybe for Edouard, Mr. Edouard Rochard? Yeah, I guess that one's for me, yes. Um, so uh, next year, I would say. Um, 
And for, for okay. our side of the group, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We 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 are committed to deliver together with uh, with, with Geodis. It's uh, it's a official uh, press release that has been released. We are we are committed to have um, a track running um, somewhere in France uh, in a big city. Um, with this kind of uh, disruptive concept, as I described in the presentation, so a uh, kind of a laboratory where we will learn a lot, and, and we do expect to raise uh, to raise volumes uh, straight after um, uh, with uh, with this kind of concept. So hopefully, very very soon. Great to to hear some good news. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. I think that we we can have uh, we can ask um, a, a last question uh, that could be also interesting to uh, to have some uh, some elements of uh, uh, of discussion and point of view. Um, when can we expect autonomous trucks? So it, it's a question I ask to you uh, as an ex as expert, of course. I don't know who wants to to take the lead specifically on this question. Because we we hear a lot of questions about that. It's it's a kind of buzzword when we say autonomous vehicles, but considering autonomous trucks, when according to you, could we expect there's an autonomous trucks? Maybe Jeroen? Yes, I can take this question. Um, yeah. Well, that that also depends on on the speed that we all want to take. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, Automotive Center of Expertise is working on a proposal to implement autonomous connected trucks uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and we are convinced that it's possible to have them uh, up and running um, in real operation uh, within 10 years. Um, but that um, uh, relies on also the, the, um, uh, the support of uh, government regulation, of course, also the OEM developing the, the, the truck. Um, but we see it's more uh, um, environment uh, thing that, that we as a society uh, need to be willing to implement it um, then that it's a real technical challenge the, the most basic the, 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 the foundations are already built in the, the technical components um, so the most um, activity should be on, on implementing getting the regulation getting the method how uh, uh, autonomous trucks are uh, uh, operated in uh, real life um, and uh, well, that's that's the challenge, and, and we're convinced that that's possible to have that implemented in um, yeah commercial operation um, yeah, within ten years, as you all all could see in the in the presentation. There's a really huge uh, benefit, not only financial but also for for our planet. Thank you very much uh, for for your answer and and your feedback. Um, really, I thank you everyone uh, for attending today's webinar. So you saw that we, we had many questions uh, related to this topic. So as I say, if you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. And of course, you will also receive a follow-up email with a link uh, to view the recording of today's webinar. And I wanted particularly to, to thank uh, our speakers today. So of course, Mr. Feldman and Van de Ver from Capgemini, but of course, a, a very kind thank you to Mr. Rochard from Volvo Group uh, for his kind and very interesting participation. Um, so on behalf of Capgemini Engineering and Volvo, Volvo Group, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much.